Hey there, folks. My name is Misadventure, and welcome to the first episode of the Monopia campaign. I am really excited to start this brand new series here on the channel. I do have to apologize for the state of my voice. You can probably still hear that I am recovering a little bit still from the coronavirus. However, it's been a little while, and I feel healthy enough to do this recording session. Honestly, the sore throat probably is going to make me talk more slowly and enunciate more clearly, which might actually improve my commentary abilities. We shall see. But either way, um, I am really excited to do this new series because this is going to be quite the experience. But before we talk about that, I do want to note that in the description down below, you can find some logistic information about the series, including the release schedule, my policy or my reasoning on uh, video length, as well as using the classical Latin pronunciation of certain words. And lastly, a full list with links to all the mods that I'll be using in this campaign, so check that out if you're interested. Let's go ahead and get started. Now, if you got the chance to see some of my live streams in the past couple weeks, you know what we're in for here, but if you didn't get the chance to see those, you're in for quite the, uh, the surprise when I reveal what we're going to be doing in this campaign. This is going to be the most challenging and technically complicated campaign I've done so far on the uh, channel. This is not necessarily the most difficult start in the game, I would not say that. Uh, this is probably one of the hardest sandbox starts in the sense that a, it is a start <clears throat> where you have a lot of different options of what to do, as opposed to being difficult because you start next to a very powerful nation or you're starting off as a vassal or something like that. So uh, you may not know who Monopia is, which is fair, they're not a major player from the historical time period. But once I reveal who we are playing as, you're going to realize very quickly what exactly we're going to be dealing with here. So, um, just to go ahead and reveal it, Monopia is also known as the Isle of Man. Monopia is the tribe that lives here on the settlement of Manawia, very confusingly. I may say Monopia and Manawia interchangeably, but uh, Monopia with the O is the name of the tribe slash the nation. Uh, you could also think of it as the tag. And then Manawia is the settlement slash the island. So although these two names are interchangeable for a good reason, because our identity is very linked to our island home, uh, they are technically two different words. I may get them mixed up. There's also confusingly Manapia over here on Hibernia, and also Menapia over here, and probably other uh, tribes or locations that have similar uh, names to these two names. So that is that. <clears throat> now, let's talk about our starting situation as Monopia, because this is going to define the difficulty of this particular campaign. First of all, something I don't normally really talk about in my campaigns, but is going to matter quite a bit for our start, is our power ranking. So we're starting off as a city-state. We only have the single settlement of Manawia to our name. Now, as a tribal city-state, uh, we can see all the various um, modifiers on the screen right there. Nothing really jumps out, except for one thing that differentiates us from the local powers that occupy the entire rest of Albion. Everyone else on Albion is local power, except for us. We are a city-state. And that distinction, that difference, is that we have an extra diplomatic relations slot as a city-state. So we have access to two relations by default, whereas other uh, nations around us are going to have access to one relation. This actually plays a pretty big role in our opening strategy, which we'll talk about later in this episode. But aside from that, you can see all the other modifiers. I can't. I can never remember uh, how these modifiers change for each power ranking, so just look at those if you want to, or compare them later on. But the diplomatic relation slot is the main thing to note about our power ranking status. Now, we have Hibernian heritage, a people whose culture has been defined by war, sea traditions, and prejudice against them. And Hibernian heritage is actually very good, and it's not just very good, it's very good for my particular playstyle and the circumstances of this campaign. So to start off with the Malice, uh, we have a minus one diplomatic reputation. If you don't remember how that works in this game, diplomatic reputation is basically an attribute or like a stat that your nation has as a nation on the national level, which other nations think about when their opinion of you is sort of set at a basic level. It is going to affect the first impression everyone gets of us. So minus one dip rep is actually not a very severe penalty at all. If we were playing for a very diplomatic focused game or had a very diplomatic oriented opening strategy, this could be an issue. However, in my experience and the way that I play this game, and I think it's uh, borne out this way in my campaigns that I've done on this channel, 
I tend to view diplomacy and alliance making through a very pragmatic lens. I basically see alliances as a short-term goal for the long-term goal of owning the land myself, mostly through military conquest. Allies, for me, are never a permanent arrangement, and I think that uh, for many uh, players who, um, or I should really say, for many nations, I should talk about on the national level, for many nations, uh, expansion and uh, taking over territory yourself is a better long-term goal than having an area be secured through an alliance. Obviously, having an ally does secure that nation to prevent them from being your enemy, but in this game, I just think the diplomacy is not really developed enough, uh, nor historically would it have been developed enough compared to the historical uh, machinations of periods like what EU4 simulates, I think, accurately. Um, in this time, nations didn't really have complicated diplomatic relations with each other, and in this game, I think that you either have a nation be your target, or you have them be not your target through you being their ally, or otherwise being confident that they won't attack you or won't be dragged into a war with you. So from my point of view, I actually don't really care that much about how other nations think about me. I can always find ways to overcompensate bad diplomatic reputation, either the stat or just kind of the concept, and I just don't think that minus one dip rep is going to really hamper my strategy, especially because I'm not looking to be anyone's friend for too long or too deeply. So that's basically my reaction to that malice. I don't think it's that big of a deal. Now the bonuses of Hibernian Heritage are very good, particularly for this start. So first of all, manpower recovery speed plus 5%. If you've ever seen any of my content, you know that I love this bonus and it's going to really help us out with our quite dire manpower situation we'll talk about in just a moment for reasons that we will also talk about in just a moment. We also have a very good ship damage taken minus 5%. This is a pretty rare modifier and I should note that while we are Hibernian, as you might expect, everyone else on Hibernia is also Hibernian in terms of the heritage. Um, now, we are not on Hibernia, but we are of Hibernian heritage. And so we and the other people on Hibernia share this modifier, the minus 5% ship damage taken. However, who doesn't share the modifier is everybody else in Albion. All these other people have different heritages. No one uh, in uh, on Britannia actually has Hibernian heritage. And there are some, for example, uh, seafaring heritages, but these don't actually affect naval combat, they affect naval economic bonuses, which is to say naval maintenance. So we actually have a straightforward naval advantage through this modifier over every other nation in Albion aside from the other Hibernians, and this is really important because we are technically, and this map can't show this, we are technically in the Caledonia region, which includes Caledonia and Hibernia and ourselves. And we are in the Wodadinia province, which includes basically where our mouse is right now. You can kind of see the more uh, bolder line here. Basically, it's southern Caledonia and ourselves. We're in the uh, Wodadinia region. <clears throat> the Wodadinia province, excuse me. We're in the Caledonia region. And because of that, a lot of our early conflict will be with people on uh, the Britannia side. We will eventually want to take over Hibernia as well, but at that point, we're hopefully are going to be using more uh, land warfare, although of course naval stuff to support. But the naval combat uh, bonus of the Hibernian Heritage is going to be really critical for the uh, game-changing, super duper important first war that we do to get a land connection onto Britannia slash Caledonia technically, up in Wododinia. Now the reason for this is one of two of the big reasons why this campaign is very difficult. Aside, and this is aside from the fact that we are starting off with one single settlement, so putting that aside. The two big reasons this campaign is difficult, which I can reveal now, the first one is because of our island status, the game thinks that we don't have any neighbors. Now, this is sort of technically true, of course, in reality we do have uh, de facto neighbors, but the game calculates the mechanic of neighboring nations through uh, literal territory touching other territory. So we don't actually touch any territory, our only territory touches only water. And so because of this, the game doesn't think that we have any neighbors, and so all of the mechanics in the game that are based on our neighbors don't activate at the start of the game. Whether they activate later on dynamically, I'm not honestly sure. But what does this mean for the start of the game? It means no War Council. The War Council considers neighboring possible claims. So War Council is not available to us at the start of the game. 
There goes our standard opening as a tribe of four claims, so that's not great. Also, it means no uh, expansion missions. We may eventually get missions that are based more on development, but of course, as you might imagine, Monopia does not have special custom missions, so the only missions available to us are the generic missions, of which there are two kinds, the expansion missions and the development missions. Development missions need us to already control a region, more or less, so that's not going to happen for quite a while. The expansion mission, as a prerequisite, needs us to actually border uh, ter territory for us to get claims on it, and we don't. And so even though we are in the Wodadinia province, and we're in the Caledonia region, we don't get the mission to try and take over more of Caledonia, the, the region of Caledonia mission that you might expect. And so there's no war council, and there's no mission. So that's the first thing that makes this start really difficult. Our normal way of getting free claims isn't available to us. We have to get all of our claims ourselves at the start. Now, once we take territory in Wododinia, will we uh, will the game reconsider and start to see us as having territory that borders uh, other areas on the islands? I'm not 100% sure because our capital will stay on Manawia. And I should note that although um, I'm going to be playing this campaign quite uh, efficiently and I'm going to focus a lot on min-maxing, I'm also going to have a bit more of a focus in this campaign on roleplay and immersion. And one way that this is going to be manifested is by me keeping my capital on Manawia for the entire game. I think it just defeats the point of having Manawia be our starting home if it ever stops being our home. So our island home will remain our island home forever, much to the chagrin, perhaps, of um, our, uh, our, uh, my audience. I'm not entirely sure how people are going to feel about that, but I think it's going to be interesting to keep Manawia as our capital forever. But, um, so that's basically the first thing that makes this campaign super difficult, is the uh, mechanical uh, shortcoming that we're going to have, thanks to Manawia being our start position. The second reason this is going to be a very hard campaign has to do with culture. Now, we're very advantageous and lucky in, uh, in Imperator Invictus, the main mod that I'm using, because all of Albion is the same culture group, the Insular Celtic culture group. It is, by the way, also the same religion. We're not going to really have religious diversity anywhere near the start of this campaign. Cultural group diversity, not so much either. But cultural diversity, absolutely. There's cultures all over the place. Now, I should note that there isn't actually a cultural difference between the Hibernians and the non-Hibernians. It's being reflected in this game through the heritage. So all the Hibernians have Hibernian heritage. But the heritage isn't actually a mechanic that affects international diplomacy on its own. It can have international diplomacy modifiers, but... Um, essentially, people on Britannia and people on Hibernia are going to have the same opinion of me because we're all insular Celts. <clears throat> now, if we had other nations who were of Monopian culture, which is my culture, they would obviously like me more, and they'd be great first targets because they control population that are, is my native population. However, things are quite grim. You'll notice there actually isn't any Monopian nation in the game, and in fact, no Monopian culture anywhere except for Monopia, or rather, Manawia. So I'm, making these, uh, I'm mixing up the names already, you see. So here we are, three Monopian pops, one citizen, one freeman, one tribesman. This is the entire Monopian population in the world at the start of the game, and this is by far what makes this campaign the hardest. This is a brutally difficult start population-wise. Population is the most important mechanic in this game, and essentially, understanding that allows you to play this game at a higher level. And this is what makes the start so difficult. These three Monopian Pops are going to have to be the basis of all of our decision-making, much of which is based on your population, because of course resources like tax and manpower come from population, so they're sort of a second uh, degree away from population. Now, what we're going to have to do is, after we start taking over Wodadinia, aggressively assimilating all the Damnonians and Wodadinians into becoming Monopians. And fortunately, because we're all the same culture group, assimilating the other insular Celts, who of course live all over Albion, to be Monopian, which is an insular Celtic culture, is going to be fairly straightforward. So that's good, right? If we were a different culture group, this probably wouldn't even be a playable campaign. However, outside of Albion, obviously that's where the insular Celtic, Celtic uh, culture group actually doesn't have any more extents. So we'll talk about our post-Albion plans much later on, but for the early game, and really the mid-game, Albion is very much our central focus. We're not really going to be thinking about Europe for quite a while. And with our very, very small starting population, we have to do some pretty careful and sneaky trickery 
careful trickery, careful maneuvering and sneaky trickery to make the most out of our very small population. Now, with all that being said, let's talk a bit more about our starting situation in terms of our nation, now that we've addressed the, the bigger picture. So, I've mentioned our heritage. We also are a Tannist tribe. Now, this sounds pretty interesting because this, I should note, is a, um, I believe, a Hibernian-specific tribal government, if we look at the government map mode, which is up here somewhere. Um, yeah, Tannist tribes all over Hibernia, but on Albion, it's all settled tribes. Now, I should note that Tannis tribe is basically a militaristic version of a settled tribe. There's not really any mechanical differences. It is just a recolor or a, a reskin of a settled tribe. It works the same as settled tribes with a centralization mechanic. And the main difference is just that it has two military ideas instead of settled tribes having a military and an oratory idea. Now, I actually would normally prefer a military and oratory idea over two military ideas. Except for this particular campaign, the two military ideas is absolutely critical because this will ensure that we have access to the, uh, the shipbuilding reduction military idea at all times in the early game, while also not having to forego the morale military idea. So very good actually for our particular opening, although if I wasn't playing as Monopia, I might be annoyed at losing access to the oratory slot. Now, similar to Settled Tribes, we get a Tribesman bonus for having our ideas be linked up. 12% tribesman happiness is obviously very strong, so we're going to be licking up those ideas ASAP because that is uh, going to be good for us in the long term. Although ironically, thanks to our very small population, we only have one third of our population because we have one tribesman at the start being affected by that. Of course, we'll later have more tribesmen. And I should note as well that moving slaves and tribesmen around within a province ignores uh, the water. So we should be able, should, with, a, with an asterisk, I think, I think this is how it works, we should be able to move population to and from Manawia into Wodadinia freely. I guess I don't know that for sure, but I'm pretty sure that's how that's going to work. If it doesn't work like that, that doesn't mean this campaign isn't possible, but that would certainly help out quite a bit, especially in the tribal stage when you can move tribesmen pretty easily. So that is something worth noting. So a Tannis tribe is uh, described here as a type of chiefdom that elects heirs from a wider dynasty. Of course, in this game, tribes don't really have any... Uh, succession dynamics at all. You just uh, The succession is done between different tribal leaders. Tannis tribes, again, work like this. So this lore is just for fun. Uh, we still have the same tribal leader succession dynamic that settled tribes do. I should also note that in this campaign, I'm going to... I'm, I'm compared to the Akenia campaign, which was my other... Uh, the Akenia, I should say, and the Karpatania campaign, which were my other recent uh, tribal campaigns. I'm going to de-emphasize the race to become centralized. I do think becoming centralized and ascending out of the tribal stage will benefit us quite a bit. However, thanks to our very difficult opening start, I just think that of all the things to prioritize or deprioritize, ascending from the tribal stage isn't actually as critical as just basically securing our survival as uh, the island of Manawia. So I'm going to still eventually centralize into a more civilized type of nation. And I will go ahead and reveal that I will be becoming a monarchy in this campaign. We're going to be the kings of the island. It's going to be really fun. But we're not going to become a monarchy for probably quite a while and at a slower pace than the Akenia campaign, which was my other tribe to monarchy campaign. Also on Albion, for what that's worth, although it was unmodded. So that's the tribe situation. Now, I've mentioned before that we are a druidic religion. Druids acted for the Celts as a distinct social class, often acting as magistrates and lawmakers. They also dictated local religious customs and beliefs. <clears throat> so druidic uh, benefits include 5% state religion happiness, and our whole population is druidic, so that's going to be nice. Manpower recovery speed plus 2.5%, 2, 2 obviously pretty good for us and an increase to monthly wages. As a tribe, you have so little income anyways that the wages of characters often doesn't make a huge difference, but it is worth remembering that. Fortunately, unlike in the Karapatania campaign, we're not dealing with a nearby religion having a combat bonus like the Iberic religion had for that campaign. In that campaign, we were playing as a Druidic nation, so worth noting that. Now, <clears throat> let's finally talk about our tribal chief. Now, the tribal chief for this nation is a random generation, because, of course, we don't know anything about this particular part of the world at this point in time, or any time near it, honestly. We've rolled a pretty good character here, actually, quite a good character. I promise you that I literally opened the game and hit record. I didn't even look at this guy until just now, so I'm pretty happy with the results. 7797 seven, seven is about as balanced and good as I could have asked for. A better character is possible, but in my experience, uh, whenever I've done test games off-stream, 
I roll some Stinker Tribal Chief, so I'm pretty happy with this. Talark Bolgius is our Tribal Chief with the amazing double beard situation, the sort of twin-tailed beard. Very cool. 31 years old. Uh, let's take a look at, look at his traits here. He has got Dumb, so that's not so great. He actually would have 9 Finesse, if not for that, so that is a little unfortunate. Reduced, um, what is that? Statesmanship? And Wonder Construction Reduction. All things that are fine, especially because his uh, finesse is already pretty good otherwise, so that's okay, but it is a little uh, little irritating that he has a negative trait. And Honest, I think that's Tribesman Productivity, Tribesman Output, 3%, that's pretty good. And this is quite good, a Malice to his Corruption Gain. Since we don't have access to that Oratory slot that Settled Tribes have access to, which of course I would put in most likely to the Corruption Reduction option, we're going to have a Corruption... Uh, reduction on him by default through being honest. That's really good. I'm not too concerned about corruption as a tribe, but it is nice that he's not going to build up corruption over the course of his life. Most likely he won't. I guess he could get big bursts of it to overcome that, but minus 0.05 per month is more than enough to account for corruption as a tribal chief. So that's honestly, that's a, that's an okay set of traits. And honestly, the stats matter much, much more for your leader than the traits, unless you have traits with really particular effects that you need to think about, like chance to uh, do plots or whatnot. So that is Teller. Once we get into the game, we'll take a look at his family. As I mentioned, this campaign will have a, a bigger focus than my previous ones on immersion and roleplay. I'll spend a bit more time looking at the characters and kind of trying to create justifications on the fly for the decisions I make through the lens of the characters making those decisions. But ultimately, I will still play this game in a very min-maxi, efficient way mostly just out of necessity because of this hellish start that we have. But Talork is actually quite a competent character, so I would trust him to lead the people of Monopia onto the uh, the mainland, as it were, <laughs> the mainland compared to Manawia. So that's that. And then lastly, of course, we have one territory. Uh, we also have uh, three uh, pops. We've talked about that quite a bit. Let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to play on Iron Man mode. This is the way I play all my campaigns, even though uh, achievements are not available with the mods that I have. We're going to leave mixed gender rules turned off. I'm fairly sure from my playtesting that, unlike some of the other druidics in the game, Hibernians, or maybe the Insular Celts more generally, can't have female officers. They can have female leaders, but not female officers. I've actually seen this distinction in a couple different nations. It seems like some nations allow female leaders and officers some allow female leaders but not officers, and some allow only male leaders and officers. So we're in that middle area. At least I think that we are. Um, I do actually see a couple other... And again, the Hibernian heritage doesn't matter here. It's the culture. So it seems the Insular Celtic group does allow... Because there are female leaders all over the place. But in my test games, I never saw female officers. So either way, that's okay. And it's nice to have access to good female characters to be the leader. But I do prefer having access to female officers, too, just to have access to higher quality characters. I tend to find that between choosing a smaller number of, uh, of possible characters and a larger number, I prefer to have the larger number because I feel I can micromanage the uh, effect of more characters pretty okay. So that's basically that. We're going to leave this turned off. The Dynastic Daidoki names, I talked about this in the first episode of the Kakapatania campaign. I'm going to turn this on just because I think it's cool and the new Dido KCB mechanics. This shouldn't affect us, hopefully, for quite a while, so we're going to leave this turned on. Let us start the game. So we're going to call this the Monopia Campaign. Very good. Let us go ahead and start. All right. So first things first, we have a lot to do in this first episode. I may not unpause in this episode uh, in what remains of it, but I actually did a lot of the prep for this campaign on those streams. I'll link the streams in the description, by the way, if you want to see me theorycraft the start quite a bit with my chat uh, over a couple hours. So uh, this episode will more so me be basically implementing the ideas that I had in the streams and then talking about them. So let's go ahead and get started with that. First of all, the, the big opening gamble we're going to make is to delete our fort on Manawia and replace it with a port. Now, I obviously don't recommend unfortifying your capital ever under any circumstance. In this circumstance, it is the rare exception where it's absolutely critically necessary to do anything at all, because without a port here, we can't have any ships, or we can't build any ships, rather. And without ships, guess who's not expanding out of being a city-state? That's right, me. So we have to destroy the port, 
destroy the fort, build the port, and then go from there. Now I should note that even without a fort here, this is still a defensible location for a couple reasons. First of all, the AI tends to be pretty transparent and pretty easy to predict when it comes to naval maneuvering. There's only so many sea tiles that we have to worry about, and in our case, our island can be reached by four sea tiles uh, arranged around it, kind of like a diamond. And each of these sea tiles can be controlled by my ships if I'm just aware of where the enemy ships are. Now, of course, um, this is still quite risky because if I lose my ships in naval combat, I'm in serious trouble and the campaign may very well be over because the enemy can land uh, an army on my unfortified capital, fully occupy it, and then that's the end for me. So I have to be really, really, really conservative with my naval uh, adventuring, especially early on before I have land on uh, Britannia. So with that being said, Fortress is going down. It's going to give us about 30 gold or so. And now we're going to do a pretty easy uh, little trick that I recommend is, if, you're, if you have access to it, trade for two copies of stone right away in order to build your um, first buildings. If you're going to do any buildings on October 1st, we've traded for stone. So now we have the stone bonus, minus 5% build cost. Saves a little bit of gold. And gold is so hard to get right now that this is quite nice. Build the port. And now we can go ahead and unimport the stone because there is uh, there are better resources to get other than stone uh, now that we have access to the slot once more. Now, in terms of what resources we want to get, um, I need to remember what I talked about in my streams. I'm fairly sure the resources I'm going to want is probably livestock for the pop promotion speed. Although actually at the moment that might not be a good idea because of my very low pop. I, I sort of don't want them all to promote right away. I think I want uh, base medals first because of the light infantry offense bonus for my first war, and I should note that my army does have a pretty sizable light infantry component. I think that's going to be the bonus that gives me the best return on investment, so let's trade uh, with some folks. I'll, I'll try and trade with people off the islands as much as possible, but if not, I'll trade with somebody. Um, hold on. I'll trade with these guys over here. All right. There we go. So we've got ourselves our base metal uh, surplus. So that's pretty good. Also, the Freeman happiness in my capital isn't a terrible thing either because we do have a Freeman at the start. Right. Now we have one more trade route available to us. And what I'm going to do is uh, lock up one of these Wodes. Now, there's only one Wode available to us. Wode is a very good resource for tribes, but it's very rare. And so the fact that we have one Wode currently available from Taxalia who will later on be a target, but of course then we'll just control the woad ourselves. In the meantime, we're going to trade for this woad, not for its immediate benefit, although 4% tribesman happiness from the one woad is pretty good, more so to secure the woad so that we can later get a second woad trade or uh, otherwise get access to a surplus of woad for the surplus bonus, which for the rest of tribal stage will be quite strong. So we're going to go ahead and grab the woad. Plus woad is a fairly valuable resource compared to the others we have access to. Obviously, here up in the middle of nowhere in Albion, we have access to very few of the resources that dominate the trade-rich Mediterranean, so that's something worth keeping in mind. Next up, our idea slot. Now, obviously, we want to get our two military ideas. It goes without saying, uh, permanent shipyards has to be one of our options here. Absolutely critical. Shipbuilding costs minus 25%. Establishment of permanent shipyards capable of constructing vessels of war will ensure that skilled shipwrights are always always at our beck and call. <laughs> my, uh, my COVID voice is uh, struggling here. Let me take a sip of my drink. Oh, man. It's, let me tell you, sore throats are the worst. The fact that it just hurts to swallow is so, so unfortunate. All right, our other military idea is going to be martial ethos. Now, I've talked before that sometimes ordered retreat is a pretty good alternative, but in our case, we need every advantage we can think of for our early wars. Martial ethos is the way to go. Ensuring that our soldiers and veterans hold a prestigious place in the social hierarchy is key to their contentment and loyalty. There we go. Tribesmen happiness, 12%, obviously very strong, especially later on once we have more tribesmen. Now, I should also note while we're looking at the screen here, that in terms of the decisions available to us, we're going to reform into a monarchy once we're able to. This requires 60 centralization, which I should note is actually not that hard to get to, so we're not in a huge rush to do this. Becoming a monarchy does actually complicate things if we aren't ready to do it, so I need to prep later in the mid-game to turn into a monarchy and kind of get prepared for that. Monarchies, I think, are going to be... Mon I should say monarchy will be the better 
alternative for this campaign than Republic for a couple of reasons. I'll talk about that later. But I just want to do a monarchy in this campaign, so that's what we're going to do. Codify state lands is a pretty good option, but it's pretty hard to pull off. And we'll, we'll talk about this later once we're more in a position to really think about this. But I'm not going to really focus on setting this up right now. Now, uniting Albion is a goal for this campaign. This will change your name and I think flag to be that of Albion. Give, a, give us a lot of advantages and bonuses. Tier 3 formable, 300 PI political influence. We get uh, 12 free pops of Monopian uh, culture, which in most cases this is kind of a throwaway bonus, but in our case might actually be kind of nice because of our very low pop. Obviously once we reach this point, we'll hopefully have many more Monopian pops uh, from conversion, but or assimilation I should say, but this is still obviously quite nice. Um, the 12, or rather the 4 Monopian citizens in particular is quite strong. Also, Manawia gains center of civilization, so I think this is one of the reasons why keeping Manawia as our capital long term is nice and thematic, because this makes our island home extra powerful from this particular decision, with the various modifiers you see on the screen. And then Monopia, the nation, gets uh, 249 months of uh, quite strong bonuses, loyalty of characters, citizen happiness, and freeman happiness, and four free province investments. So, uniting Albion is the goal of the campaign, more or less. I will talk in future episodes about my post-Albion plans for Europe, but for now, we're going to fixate on Albion pretty closely here, because that is even that is beyond the extent of our starting capabilities as Manawea slash Monopia. I should also note that we can technically unite Britannia. However, in this campaign, and this is an example of a roleplay thing over an efficiency thing, I'm going to not unite Britannia, or at least I won't click this button. I will actually take over Britannia on my way to taking over Albion, but I won't ever do the unite Britannia decision. Now, why is this? It's mainly because Monopia isn't in Britannia. It's actually in, I can show you this now that we're in the campaign here. Monopia is in Caledonia. You can see here it's the same green color as Caledonia. You can see that Talork is in charge of our Caledonia holdings. So. It just doesn't really feel right to be a Caledonian location and be able to unite Britannia. Playing as a Kenya, I did actually unite Britannia, and I didn't actually get to uniting Albion in that campaign. So I feel like the uniting Britannia experience is already on my channel in the Kenya campaign. For this campaign, we will take over Britannia, but I am not going to be uniting Britannia as a decision, just because it feels like my people identify more with the Caledonians and not the Britannians, even if we're all insular, insular Celts, we're all Druidic. So this distinction isn't really, um, doesn't really make any sense, but either way. So <clears throat> that's basically what I have to say about that. We're not going to unite Britannia in this campaign, although we will later on unite Albion. So that is that. Now my starting uh, policy over here in Wododinia is encourage trade. This is probably fine for now. I don't need to change this uh, immediately, although I will want to change it once we start to take over land into, obviously, cultural assimilation. I may change this during this episode. I need to come back to this after I do my other actions, though. I don't remember how much PI I'll have left, so we will return to that. All right, now, <clears throat> government-wise. So we've taken a look already at Talork. Let's take a look at his family. He has a spouse, uh, Gwendolyn Urkea, who is 10 years his junior. Always fun to see that. She's got nine martial, zero finesse, two charisma, and eight zeal. So she's actually quite a good martial character. Perhaps she'll be our admiral, which would be pretty interesting. She is plain speaking and zealous. So that gives her uh, some modifiers that aren't going to matter uh, since she's not an officer or the ruler. She also is pregnant, by the way. So her due date is the 9th of July, uh, 451. So let's keep that in mind. And uh, she also has a child, a daughter named Alauna Bulgia. should also note, of course, that Bulgia slash Bulgius is the name of our family. So we may eventually see the emergence of the Bulgii uh, monarchy, which will be very cool. <clears throat> so let's go back to that. So um, no traits in the baby. So basically things look fine. Her loyalty seems pretty secure. In my experience, uh, the wives of the rulers, or otherwise the spouses of the rulers, seem to be pretty chill. Uh, no super severely bad traits or anything like that, so that's pretty good. I'm also, while I'm here, tell this guy about Scheme Influence. That's pretty necessary to get the extra PI. Very good. Let's take a quick look at the other clan chiefs. So we've got Talurk, uh, Bulgius as our main tribal chief. We've also got uh, Tazgetius Baraganus. This is a uh, 9296 character, so 
Wouldn't be the best ruler ever with that very low finesse, but a pretty good uh, war leader. And your tribal chiefs mainly play the role, or your clan chiefs I should say, mainly play the role of generals for you as a tribe, so this, that's pretty good to see. In terms of his traits, he is shrewd and he is trusting, so an interesting combination there. Uh, his loyalty is pretty secure because of trusting. I think shrewd maybe should reduce loyalty, but I'm, I'm not upset that it doesn't in this case. So an extra loyal clan chief is pretty good, so that's good to see. I don't see any uh, any problem traits or any issues with this character that need to be discussed here, so we'll leave it that at that. So Tazgetius Marganes is our first chief. The other chief is Kawarinus Urkus. should also note that uh, Tazgetius is our same age as us. Kawarinus is 21 years old. He uh, has 9880, so another very, very strong character. This time he's very low on zeal. This guy would actually would have been a pretty good leader because I don't tend to find zeal matters that much for the tribal stage or for my play style. Uh, in terms of his situation, he is tough. Okay, so this guy is going to be my admiral. Oh, no, I guess I can't make him an admiral because he's a clan chief. I actually don't recall if... I don't think clan chiefs can be made as admirals. If I could, ship damage taken mass 5%, that's quite good. Blunt, yeah. So ultimately, another fine character. He has a slightly higher base loyalty, so he has similar loyalty to the extra loyal clan chief. So overall, in terms of my chief situation, I've got a very well-rounded tribal chief, and then two really militaristically strong clan chiefs, which is pretty good for my starting situation, all things considered. As a tribe, you're really at the mercy of how good your clan chiefs are for your military capabilities. Also, by the way, as I noted earlier, hear me clicking. It's not happening. War Council is not available to us because of the lack of neighboring countries. And just for uh, thoroughness, yeah, no missions available either. So I wasn't lying about that. <laughs> that is our handicap for this particular campaign start. Now, I'm going to go ahead and actually dismiss all of my officers and my researchers and reorganize them myself. I don't generally trust this game to assign the right characters to this, so I'm just going to do this right now. Uh, this will take a lot of this first episode, I should probably note. Let's also go into the researchers and do that there. And ideally find some characters with good research traits to throw in here. But we'll do that last. I shall just I'll check really quick. We have a scholar here. Guit Sonorius. Alright, we'll, we'll keep you around for that. Okay. <clears throat> go back over to here. So, in terms of this. So let's go ahead and assign uh, this guy here. Let's see. Do we have our highest for this. Oh, hold on. We'll go for Marshall. Maybe we got some good... Yeah, we can see no female officers available to us. That's fine. Some really, really good um, Marshall characters, then. That's a pretty good sign. Okay. So let's go ahead and assign you here. Loyalty. This is from Scorn Families. That's gonna... He's also selfish, which is a little unfortunate, but... Once the family is no longer scorned, he should no longer be in range of disloyalty, so that's pretty good. Um, actually, I should probably assign him to Elder, shouldn't I? Yeah, let's assign you here, assign you to Elder. I, I, Elder is a more important uh, position for tribe because of tribesman happiness. Okay, uh, war chief and, bo <coughs> and bodyguard. Um, let's assign... Do I have really... Let's see here. I think his bodyguard the one. Yeah, manpower recovery speed, that's really important. Assign you. And then... So that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. And over here... And lastly, I'm at, I'll talk about these characters later, but I'm just trying to get this all set up here. probably fine. Okay. We still have some score in here. Why is this? We need one more Marganii assigned. Well, we'll do that in the research world. Alright, so our one Marganii remaining is terrible at everything, so let's assign him to be the uh, the civic the civic guy. He's, he's the least bad at that. Alright. Our martial guy is going to be our scholar here. Uh, Buit Sonorius. Now we're at the point where we've run out of all of our family characters. Now we'll just assign for merit, or at least for what merit we have remaining. We can assign a pretty good oratory advancer. 
and we can assign probably a pretty good religious advancer. There we go. So just like that, uh, I don't remember what stats all the characters had before, and some of them had built up statesmanship, which we'll have to rebuild. That's fine. I think this is usually the, the better practice, at least for me, because I like to know that all my spots are uh, optimally assigned. So in terms of uh, technology, um, we've got one uh, assignment for political reasons. We have one assignment for the scholar trait, and then the other two are for merit, basically. Donis, uh, Okinus, and Awitas Ercus. Uh, looks like all these characters have pretty secure loyalties. I'm not too concerned about any of them. Over in the world of officers, uh, loyalty-wise, 53, 48, 83. Dang, he's submissive and he's devout. And his family is married to the royal family. Yeah, this war chief is never betraying us ever. So that's pretty good. Uh, 43. Yeah, things are looking pretty secure loyalty-wise around here, so I'm not too concerned about that. In terms of the uh, the stats, obviously this is all pretty strong. I think I made the right call, having my highest stat characters be optimized to be the bodyguard for the manpower recovery speed. <coughs> and the uh, war chief for the monthly military experience, so that's pretty good. Alright, and my family uh, loyalty is secured, so we got three for three, all these different things. Without female officers available to us, another problem we're going to have, or rather without the, uh, the ability to assign female officers, Families will run out of male characters for us to assign, we'll have to assign either nobody and suffer the scorn family situation, because the clan chief position I don't think counts as a position, which is very annoying. Um, actually it might, uh, I actually can't remember, but either way, um, yeah, actually I don't think the clan chief position counts as an office, even though it obviously is. Either way, um, yeah, so that is that, uh, right. So next up, we're going to go over to laws. Uh, we are going to start uh, changing our laws to improve our centralization. Now, between uh, barter economy stat statutes and coin minting initiative, I actually will go for the one that gives us more centralization, even though I'm de-emphasizing that, because the other modifier, monthly civ change, is very, very, very strong for a tribe, particularly in our situation where we have zero civilization value in Manawia. So that's pretty bad. We need to boost that up ASAP and our best way is to get coin minting initiatives. So let's go ahead and grab this now. I did all my government stuff first because this will uh, bring us closer to uh, losing control of our government when our stability gets too low. So let's go ahead and grab that. 20 uh, stability, by the way. Once you get to that or below, your government basically goes into freeze mode and you can't do anything. So we're going to do all this stuff before we drop our stability even further. The uh, Actually, before we talk about that, uh, tax-wise, I'm going to go ahead and decrease the pay for now in order to get uh, extra integrated culture happiness. This is a very, very small micro optimization thing. This probably doesn't matter that much, but aside from that, we're gonna leave this all as is. Religion wise, we always start with a random role of who it, our gods happen to be. And we have started here with, okay, Terranus, that's really important. The discipline plus 3% is critical for our early war against uh, Damnonia that we're gonna talk about in a moment. Cassonius here for noble happiness and, and, and uh, com. <clears throat> noble happiness and commerce income. Oh my gosh, this this COVID is destroying my brain. Um, possibly going to switch you to Nanto Swelta for the extra discipline. Just any bonus I can think of. That might be a bit overkill, but we'll come back to that. Belly Sama for the research points in Pop Assimilation. Having the Pop Assimilation Omen is actually really, really important for our post-war uh, trying to turn population into... Uh, Monopian pop, so I will definitely keep uh, Belly Sama. I don't think there's any pop assimilation passive gods, that'd be really strong, so I'm gonna definitely keep Belly Sama and turn to Belly Sama after our war against Amnonia at the very uh, earliest. And RTO is uh, okay. I probably want to switch to Coentina for the monthly stab change omen. Yeah, probably. But I think for now, the most important thing to do is change Cassonius over to Nanto Svelta. Now, uh, Lugus is a very good alternative. 15% commerce income passively is extremely powerful, but for the early game, our commerce economy isn't really going yet, so we just need military advantages for our opening war, and that's what we really need to focus on at, at first. So we're going to go for Nanto Svelta, switch this over. This will freeze our government, but all of our... Uh, Government decisions. Imagine. Before, let me do that last actually, just in case there's anything I forgot to do first. So we will be switching though, uh, Cassonius to Nanto Svelta a bit later. 
I'm not going to do any decisions with my one uh, culture, uh, my, my one culture that I have access over, uh, because there's nothing really to worry about, so we're going to leave that as it is. Trade is fine. We looked at our military already. Not really any mercenaries accessible to us. All right, diplomacy-wise. Now, with our remaining PI, because of course switching our omen doesn't actually cost PI, it only costs stability. So we have 25 PI to work with, and we could use this PI for a number of things, political influence. <clears throat> One of these things could be switching our governor policy here over to uh, cultural assimilation now, in preparation for once we are taking land up in Wododinia. Of course, we're in Wododinia already, but mainland Wododinia is up here, and then we're technically in Wododinia too. So that is an option. The other thing we could do with it <clears throat> is switch our stance. Now we start with neutral stance, which gives us one more diplomatic relation, because as I mentioned earlier, we're a city-state with the two, then we have one from here, we have three available to us. I only need two relations in order for my opening strategy to work. So what I think I'm going to do is wait a couple months and then switch neutral stance over to bellicose stance, not normally a stance I really mess around with, in order to then get a cheaper <coughs> claim fabrication on Damnonia. Um, because, of course, we can't get the free claim on Damnonia. I could alternatively start claiming Damnonia right now. However, then it'd be too early, because I actually have to build my port, which will take uh, around six months, and then build my entire fleet. And I actually need to build quite a few ships in order to ferry my, my men over and otherwise prepare for the war, because, of course, my navy needs to be bigger than the navy of any of my enemies, and Damnonia will certainly pick up an ally before then. So what I will do is switch from neutral stance to bellicose stance after a couple of months when I have 30 PI. In the meantime though, I can still make allies uh, even if I uh, am not using all three relations because I don't want to go above my relation limit because then it affects my PI. So what I need to do is pick up two allies even though I have access to three. And then once I uh, go to bellicose stance, I'll be at two out of two. So that's the plan with that. Now my two allies for the Damnonia and later Wododinia conflicts are I think pretty set in stone at this point. Voluntia is an absolute necessity because they border Damnonia by the strait. The goal here is that Voluntia draws Damnonia over the water, and the way it works in Imperator Rome is if your side of the war controls one side of the strait, your navy can block the strait. So if I can block Damnonia's people in Voluntia, or if Voluntia comes over to Damnonia and fights them in Damnonia, that's also totally fine. Either way, this strait being part of the war is extremely important because it also keeps Anomnia's army walking around and not getting on their boats and coming over to Manawia. So we have to think about it very defensively. So we're going to offer our alliance to Voluntia first and foremost. This is going to go without any problem. So Voluntia is now our ally. Now the other person we're going to ally with is probably going to, and this is more of the swing one, is probably going to be Brigantia. Brigantia is going to be more of a long-term ally than Voluntia. In fact, after the, the Damnonia War, I might not even maintain the Voluntia alliance going forward. The Brigantia alliance will be a longer-term thing, mainly because Brigantia is right at the northern edge of the Britannia region. Again, remember, I'm going to focus on taking over Caledonia first, and then I'll turn towards Br uh, Br Britannia later. <clears throat> Sorry about that my voice. <laughs> so Brigantia is going to be a good ally because they're right up against the border of the territory that I want, and they do technically just barely border Damnonia themselves, so they will likely be able to draw Damnonia. If Damnonia doesn't go into Voluntia, they're going to go over here towards uh, Brigantia's capital at Dolur, which is quite far away, and uh, mainly we'll have them walking over rough hill terrain very slowly over here. So while my army and navy are stationed at Manawia, basically Damnonia has to send their forces either over the strait into Voluntia or across the earth into uh, Brigantia, uh, making their capital Damnoniae, which is accessible by a landing from the Mare Hibernicum, a possibility for me, assuming that I can avoid their navy or destroy their navy. So that's the basic idea. So we're going to go ahead and ally with Brigantia as well. The, Br the Brigantine Alliance is actually more important, in a way, than the Woluntian Alliance. Woluntia is just a really good ally for this war specifically. Brigantia is also a great ally for my next war against Wododinia, who they also border. Now, the issue, of course, with any uh, allies in this game is that they'll take uh, provincial capitals that you want. Against Damnonia, who are split across two different provinces, um, their other provincial capital is Alt-Klut, 
My opening strategy for the war, which will probably happen in episode, or in fact will definitely happen in episode two, is probably to actually run up, or rather sail up with my uh, with my army and my navy once their navy is pacified, and grab Alt Clut really quick, and then maybe run back to Manawia, or then sail down and relocate to Damnonia to start sieging it. I don't think that I'm in serious danger of Voluntia or Brigantia somehow getting to Alt Clut before me, especially because the AI doesn't really use its navies very uh, intelligently. It does use them reactively pretty well, but it doesn't use them intelligently to snipe unfortified provincial capitals like that, so I should be able to get to Alt Clip pretty easily. Um, but uh, as for Damnonii, because it is more reachable by land, basically they can't reach anywhere by land up to Alt Clip before getting to Damnonii, so that's more vulnerable to them. I should also note that Damnonia will probably take an ally. In my test games, it often allied with Carvetia, which uh, Brigantia handily counters. It could also ally with Wododinia, which could present other problems, because then Brigantia could try and take Wododinia land. I could always end the war against Damnonia, taking Damnonia and leaving Wododinia to be recontrolled by themselves, and then taking on Wododinia later, so not a huge problem. I don't really foresee Damnonia picking up any other allies that would present a huge strategic issue, so that should all be fine. Either way, my diplomacy is now basically secure, so that is pretty good. Technology-wise, of course, we're not going to have any, basically any research at all for a long time, so no, no need to worry about this for quite a while. We already talked about our main families and the clan chiefs. I'll maybe talk a bit more about some of their characters a bit later on as they become relevant, but I don't want to dwell on that too much at the moment. And then lastly, no missions available at all, as we've talked about. So <clears throat> lastly, let's go ahead and get our omen thing set up. So we're going to switch Cassonius over to Nanto Suelta. We're going to get the passive discipline bonus immediately. And within five years, we're definitely going to be going to war. So the three discipline and the three discipline, and then also the... Where is it? Also the five morale. So we have six discipline and five morale. At best, Damnonia gets uh, none of these gods, because they have the same gods uh, accessible to them as we do, and not that bonus. Um, I'm not sure what they'll do once I hit unpause uh, next episode. But um, we're going to at least have the same bonuses available as them, or better than them, which is important. So that is good that we've set that all up. And then lastly, we have to pick our omen. I think for this first uh, five-year increment, because I don't anticipate actually uh, beating Damnonia with much left in the five-year increment, I'm not sure if the Belisama pick for this first five-year increment is the best idea. I think what I'll probably do is actually pick Archeo for the first five years for the hostile attrition. This is basically just an extreme, conservative, super careful pick, because I don't actually think anyone will land on Manawia. If people are landing on Manawia, it's probably a reset anyways, but just because, well, in that case actually, because I don't plan for anyone to land on Manawia, and I don't think I'll have land where this would affect on Pretania set up yet. I think it will go for Belisama, just in case I do win the war and I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to, um, inter, uh, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to assimilate people, uh, in Wododinia. Uh, once the war is over. So let's go ahead and grab Belisama. Then I'm, I'm probably overthinking it, not getting Belisama. So let's grab Belisama, because Belisama is going to be my reselected uh, Pantheon uh, god for probably a lot of the early games. So let's just get it going here. Belisama is a solar goddess worshipped across Gaul and Britannia. She is the female form of the even more famous uh, Belinus, a god occasionally said to be her husband, both known as the one who moves the sun across the sky. Among the Romans, she is occasionally associated with their goddess of wisdom, Minerva. Alright, so that's Belisama. Pop assimilation speed, plus, point five, or plus 5.3... Plus 5.30 percent. God, COVID is destroying my brain. Uh, that is a very strong bonus, and when paired with our later on, we won't do it yet because we need to save up for the uh, diplomatic uh, position change. When later paired up with our uh, pop assimilation, cultural assimilation, pop assimilation bonus from for uh, Wododinia, that's going to be really important. And I will close out this episode by noting that, um, as I've said before, but I'll say it again here, because understanding how assimilation works in this game is going to be critical to understanding my strategy in the opening of this campaign. The way assimilation works is it is a flat uh, settlement by settlement mechanic. So keep that in mind. So each settlement separately is doing assimilation on its own t like time separately. So let's look at, uh, actually we, we can't even see it because there's no assimilation happening here. So let's say for example that I controlled Nawante, which is peopled by two Damnonian tribesmen. Now, 
each so the assimilation bar would would pick one population to assimilate and it would say like one tribesman assimilating in 460 as just a random example i just made up now this would happen by default very actually it wouldn't be 460 by default with no other modifier it'd be like 490 or something so very very slowly pops would assimilate to your uh, native culture however if you have a uh, percent modifier such as our omen this speeds up that very slow amount by 5.30 percent so it would be noticeable however 0.0001 percent assimilation plus 5.30 percent is not a huge increase so this wouldn't really be game changing the reason this is game changing for us is actually because of the policy that we're going to have of culture assimilation so plus 0.80 we have to keep in mind it's a very, very, it's like less than 0.1 or something, the default amount that assimilation happens. I'm actually not sure about that, but from my experience, without any modifier at all, assimilation in each settlement is very, very, very slow because the base number, think of this as the anchor number, is very small. So cultural assimilation, what this policy does is it replaces that base number with this much bigger 0.80 number. I don't know, again, how small the base number is, but it's much less than 0.80. So cultural assimilation basically gives you a much bigger anchor number and then the reason that that omen that i just picked is really strong is the omen is then modifying the anchor number of plus 80 or rather plus 0.80 i wish it was plus 80 plus 0.80 so what this will mean is instead of the 5.3 percent making the like 0.1 percent up to like 0.105 percent it becomes it makes the plus 80 it increases that by 5%. So I don't know offhand what that is, but it turn, turns this into like plus point, you know, 85 or, or uh, 87 or something. So the difference, so this is all very complicated because this is impaired to Rome, but the main difference between having just the omen and having the policy in the omen, because a newer player wouldn't really understand this because this is not communicated at all to the player whatsoever. I have, I had to, I've had to learn this myself, right? So. Essentially, pop assimilation uh, speed, the flat number modifier, is extremely powerful, and it, it basically turns on the power of the pop assimilation uh, speed percent bonus. So even though they're both called pop assimilation speed, the one that has the percent is the modifier on the one that doesn't have the percent. And you need to have as large as possible, this is like multiplicative stuff, this is uh, you know complicated math, the anchor number has to be as high as possible to get the most value out of the percent modifier. So that's the basic situation. Uh, having the omen active will help a bit, but having the omen active and applying to the policy is going to really, really, really increase our assimilation, making each pop assimilate maybe even in a couple years, which is very good because of our very low starting population of our integrated native culture. So that's the basic explanation of my cultural assimilation master plan and my broader opening idea for this campaign. This episode has been uh, a great strain on my throat, but I hope that my commentary has been audible and uh, understandable. As you can probably tell, even though I am very tired, I haven't slept very well during my illness, and I'm still kind of under the weather, I am very excited about this campaign. Uh, even if I don't sound excited, hopefully my passion and uh, engagement in this campaign is pretty clear from all the, all the thought that I've put into it. So this is going to be a really fun campaign, and hopefully very soon I'll be able to do some more recordings with a slightly less incapacitated uh, vocal performance. So thank you all so much for watching this first episode of the Monopia campaign, and I'll see you all again very soon for episode two. See you all next time.